Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and you are at the intersection of sexuality and religion, where it meets at LGBTQ Avenue and LDS Street. Thank you for joining us for another episode. We're glad to have you along and glad to have you participate. Fascinating episode for you today. Uh, our guest today is familiar to the podcast. Uh, Lori Lee Hall has been on the Latter Gay Stories Podcast a couple times before. That's right. Um, we, we've talked about, about, about a variety of things, so it's good to have you back again because the last time you you were on the uh, podcast. We were discussing your book that you were writing. Uh, we went through your your uh, oral history, um, kind of your life experience, and you mentioned uh, what was it? Probably two years ago that you were writing a book. That's and, right. And here we are. Right. And I'm really glad to be back. And I actually have. Uh, the book in hand. <laughs> it's real life. And so um, that's what we're talking about today. The book is called uh, Dictates of Conscience um, from Mormon High Priest to My New Life as a Woman, Lori Lee Hall. So I'm super excited to have uh, Lori here in studio, super excited to be able to actually touch the book. Yes. I remember uh, President Hinckley's biography. He talked about the Book of Mormon as being something that you could heft something that you could touch. And finally, we have your book that we can heft. A transgender Mormon story that we can touch. Um, to my knowledge, it might be the very first one. Um, it's possible. I think there may be a few other minor ones that have been created, but this is a story that will resonate across multiple spectrums, multiple hot buttons. I'm really, really, really excited about it. Um, and we've... The, the, this really isn't kind of a dissection of personal story um, per se, a typical interview where we just kind of start from the beginning and, and move forward. The book is really, really good. Um, published by Signature Books. Mm -hmm. So first, um, as the audience listens, and it, this really isn't just a promotion for a book. To me, this is much bigger than the book. This is, this is an understanding of a story. Uh, we, we've had an interview about your own personal story, but this book really gives us an opportunity to kind of pull back the curtain and see the inner workings of the Mormon church. Because um, your resume isn't just Lori Lee Hall, transgender woman. Your resume, well, I'll let you speak. Tell the audience some of the, just a few of the amazing things you've, you've done for <laughs> Mormonism. Right. So... Um, serving as a bishop and a stake president um, for pretty much full terms in both cases. So over the course of 15 years, um, holding keys to a ward or to a stake, um, but also during a, the majority of that time, serving as chief architect for the church, um, responsible for the design and or construction of temples and other special projects for the church. Um, in those days, it was, it was church 24-7, and I was totally devoted to uh, giving all that I could to, uh, to building it up, both figuratively and spiritually. And I liked in the appendix of the book, and the readers will be able to, to get this when they get their copy, but when you, when you kind of flip to the back of the book, you can see um, the things, the projects that you were involved in. And um, maybe someone remembers the Brisbane, Australia Temple, Sacramento, California, Helsinki, Finland, Panama City. Well, that's just page one. And then we move on to the next page, which is uh, Fort Collins, Tijuana, uh, Calgary, Alberta, Brigham City. We're going to talk about Brigham City Temple. Right. Um, temple, 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 temple you, you were involved in. Long list. Uh, so many. And then we get to special projects. Mm -hmm. And I think people have probably heard of something like the Welfare Square. Mm -hmm. uh, they probably heard of... Um, the Salt Lake Tabernacle re uh, uh, restoration, and we can tell a great story. You share a great story about President Hinckley mm -hmm. um, during that that restoration. The Church History Library, the LDS Business College, BYU uh, Salt Lake Center. Uh, I mean, just just a lot. The Provo MTC. Uh, that was another project that you had. The St. George Family History Center, the Mexico MTC. The books just got a lot. So well, I couldn't not put that appendix in as a list because people were, were going to ask the questions, gee, what, what were you involved with? Well, there's a, a good starter list of the things that I was either the director or the manager of at the time. And, and I think in our last interview, we just really described this. This, these were Mormonism's most sacred and holiest spaces. Mm -hmm. uh, the, and I don't think we even mentioned the Provo City Center Temple, right. uh, the, the one that burned. This right. was 
we we discussed that great uh, in great detail in the the last interview. But that was that was another project that you were involved in. The literal and and you got a chapter in here about the ashes mm -hmm. um, from from ashes. This tr great transformation that happened both for the Provo City Center Temple and and you yourself. And so, I just love the parallels. I, I, I lo love the analogies you worked in the through the book. And that's uh, that's why we're here. I, I I really want to give the audience an opportunity to, to really see the inner workings of Mormonism. Your your direct contact with the first presidency of the church, um, particularly Thomas S. Monson, Gordon Hinckley, uh, uh, you, um, Henry Eyring. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was just a uh, Gary Stevenson, just a lot of names that are going to be very, very familiar to uh, a Mormon audience that you had direct, um, in fact, line, uh, direct line communication uh, with these individuals as, uh, as these things were happening. So, yeah. yeah. Um, Ha yeah, just happy to have you here. Happy to be able to to discuss it. So let's first start. Let's just jump in. Okay. One of the great, one of the first parts that I I loved but didn't love. Um, you start the book um, with your excommunication. Yeah, our our opening chapter um, is uh, the evening of my excommunication, which was June fourth of twenty seventeen. Uh, Sunday evening, it happened to be Pride Celebration Sunday in Utah which was terribly ironic. And uh, the excommunication, the Church Disciplinary Council had been coming uh, for several weeks. And in fact, I had been told to uh, write a letter and ask for my membership to be uh, removed from the church. I didn't want to do that. Um, I, I didn't feel it in my heart to do that. And so immediately a disciplinary council was scheduled. And I describe in this first chapter as a way to kind of peek at the future conflict that the book was going to share, what it was like to sit down in the same high council room in the stake center where I had presided as stake president only five years earlier, uh, and actually sit down amongst um, 16 men, most of whom I had served with in the church, and in many cases had ordained or had set them apart to callings, including the callings that they currently had, as they now sat in judgment of me. And I mention in the book, uh, being in this room with these friends again for the first time in years should have been a reason to rejoice, but I was painfully jolted back into the moment when the stake president announced the purpose of the meeting. Quote, Brother David Bruce Hall Jr., quote, he addressed me even though I'd had this name rendered obsolete by Utah's third district court nine months earlier. In a moment of feigned sensitivity, he looked down into his lap and explained that he needed to refer to me by the name appearing on my church record. We both knew that he had refused my request to, uh, re to change my record to reflect my neat legal name and gender markers, even though the church policy allowed for the name change, he refused to do it. Um, even worse, he had required that each bishop instruct their ward members to never call me by my chosen affirming name, Lori Lee, or refer to me as Sister Hall. And I'll just read one more paragraph. I silently noted his hypocrisy as symbolic of the more significant contention surrounding that night's council. The church was on record and documents submitted as amicus briefs to the United States Supreme Court linking fu the fundamental church doctrines and teachings to the widely held assumption that gender is only equivalent to an individual's assigned sex at birth. The, this official position eliminated any possibility of a person's right to define their gender identity should it differ from their birth sex assignment. And that theme of running up against that concern um, will permeate our discussions today. Um, it it's symbolic to me that the faith tradition that I contributed so much of my time and talents to as a, as a member and as a leader and as an employee um, 
should turn on me on such a frail hinge of, uh, of my gender identity versus their view of a sign sex at birth. I think that's the one part that really confused me because it, it almost seemed like this stake president went out of his way to make sure you were not accommodated, even though there were uh, provisions in the handbook and provisions in church policy that allowed him to change your gender marker on church records. Mm -hmm. um, and you can even, now the church is, even allows you to update family tree with same-sex relationships. Mm -hmm. And so this wasn't out of the ordinary. This wasn't, you weren't asking for some special or unique accommodation. This was already within the policy. But yet this stake president went out of his way to ensure that that doesn't happen for you. Exactly. And I think the book will show that there was a particularly challenging moment of time in the 2015 to 2017 time frame when much of this occurred um, for the church with regard to sexual orientation uh, the policy of exclusion came out, marriage equality occurred in the, in the United States. Um, and also, I briefly referred in the text that I just read to the amicus brief that the church had submitted regarding gender identity. And there was just a significant amount of turmoil, churning, if you will, taking place at church headquarters concurrent with me coming out and going to live full time and, and trying to still walk the halls of uh, of um, of uh, the church, um, initially the church offices, and then when they lo long, no longer allowed me to do that to at least attend church with my family. It all happened at a particularly difficult time as the church was trying to put its policies for gender identity in place and carve out for themselves legal protections, which the church always seems to be so interested in, um, having the religious freedom to, to require binary gender or sex designations in their universities and other settings um, to keep boys and girls apart and there's nobody in between and there's no swapping of teams. Um, I think in the long history of the church and LGBTQ issues, that 2015 to 2017 timeframe was when the transgender issue really became um, on their radar and where they really started pushing out, um, in many ways, confidential teachings, which my, my book captures some leaked information of what the author the general authorities were teaching stake presidents at that time and so if my stake president appeared to be acting fairly conservatively towards me it's because he had recently received specific training about the inappropriateness of a transgender person attending church as their true authentic self it was there was a lot of word from headquarters coming down on those issues that I wasn't aware of at the time it was occurring. And it seemed to me like it surprises you. It was onerous, you know, to not just simply call me by my name. I'm, I'm attending church, you know, in a lovely skirt and top and, and uh, female shoes. And why can't I be Sister Hall? Why can't I go to Relief Society? There was just no, re no willingness to respond to any of that at all but to make it as difficult for me as possible. And I didn't know really why, other than the fact that it was happening in the stake where I had served for so long. And I always have said, and I probably said this in past interviews with you, that if you are reaching a point in life where you're gonna have to navigate a significant life change, wouldn't you want to do it amongst your family and friends and community where you know you've been loved and where you have given love and have served, or should you do it amongst strangers? And as it turned out, I chose to do it amongst those who I loved and who I felt loved me. And I would have been much less harmed if I had done it amongst strangers. What a great, what a great segue into kind of now as this book is going to unfold, because it, as you described that, I'm just thinking like, yes, this book really is full of uh, expectation. Um, missed expectation and exceeded exceeding my expectation. And so 
um, in chapter five of your book, you're gonna. You, I think the uh, title, uh, the, the title of that chapter is your Gettysburg Address, and and you you share a story about expectations um, of your father uh, from your father of you, and I, I just thought that was really great. And I also want to remind the audience too, um, uh, kind of off the re- off the uh, interview prior to to us um, sitting down, we discussed the book and. And one thing that you you said that I thought was really important was that this is a book of happy endings. It uh, is. <laughs> this, this isn't a book of sadness. Um, of course, there parts of this journey are sad. Parts of the, this journey have been very very difficult. But this isn't this isn't a cry about my experience book. This is a very positive, uplifting with a happy ending book, mm-hmm. which I really really enjoyed. I, I I've simply said it's a happy ending book because I'm still here and I'm joyfully authentic. Uh, I get to be myself. I get to do the things we'll talk about in a bit. Um, and so the book does have a happy ending. There's, I make reference to Joseph Campbell, uh, the American uh, comparative religion writer, um, who talks about the fact that sometimes you have to go through what look like train wrecks of experiences to then develop them into triumphs. And that's really what this book is about. It's a book about hope. Stories have power. Stories can change lives. This, my story, I think, has the power to save lives, and it, it is a positive book. And I appreciate you pointing that out because there's a lot of stuff to have to grind through if you if you get down into the muck of of what I describe here. But it's really about winning in the end, triumphing, and and the success and the joy of being authentic. And and the transgender experience is shared by a very small. Um, um, percentage-wise number of people. And so it, it would be really easy to say, well, but this doesn't really apply to me. And and my counter to that is as we read the stories and experiences of individuals uh, mentioned in this book, you can see how an ally community is so important. You'll find how even just the, the experience of a good parent who mm-hmm. recognizes um, the uniqueness of a child could be uh, the difference between success and years of, of pain and uh, maybe wasted bandwidth or, or expenses that weren't necessary in order to find uh, level footing or happiness. So, th- and this is this story that you talk about in chapter five uh, about playing baseball um, with your father. Mm-hmm. I think now begins to build that picture of, of kind of what we're talking about here, expectation uh, versus reality. And then what happens after uh, in your mind, I, I, I want to know how you process this experience and, and how that could have been done better. Yeah, yeah. Could you remind me what page I'm on? Uh, 37, sorry. 37, okay. Yeah. I don't want to spend too much time searching for it. Okay. Um, this had never happened before. This is where you were talking about your dad coming in, uh, uh, inviting you to go out and play baseball. Right, right, because I, I did describe how my parents were both coaching my, my sister's teams and, uh, you know, ball teams and so forth, and I'd how much I wanted to be included in a girls' softball team, and uh, that was not to be, of course. But, um, yeah. boy, I'm still not seeing it, Kyle. <laughs> Might have to push edit on this experience. No, you're good. Um, Chapter five, page 37, middle paragraph. This had never happened before. Oh, thank you. I was on 38. It's a good thing we have editors. So yeah, this setting of this story is we, um, we actually had um, a softball field was constructed next to our house where I could literally walk up the driveway and right onto the softball field. And the way I've written it in here is that something that had never happened to me before, my both my parents were very athletic, and I assume they expected that uh, that their kids would be as well. But this is this experience that I'm going to read has got so many layers that we can talk about in a minute. This had never happened before. Um, Dad asked me, "Want to play some catch?" And he already had his baseball mitt in his hand. He was he was ready to go out onto the field. I ran back to the house for my glove and then met dad on the newly built ball field next to uh, his shop. He crouched down like a catcher behind the home plate and had me stand back a distance to pitch to him. 
He called out where my pitch should land and uh, mixed it up each time. After several throws, he stood and saying nothing, walked off the field and back into his shop. Nothing was ever talked about again, and he never asked me to do it again. I wandered back to my room, figuring I had failed to meet his expectations as a son once more. And the fact that it had happened once is a story in, in and of itself, but the fact that I felt like I was constantly being proven to see if I was an effective son when in reality the long-term understanding is that no I was I was never a son and I wasn't very good at being the son the the manly boy that he wanted and uh, ironically and I do mention this in the book later when I finally came out to my dad at age 53 or so um, he seemed relieved in a way he accepted me and he seemed relieved somehow. And I, I look back at it and think that all his years of thinking that he had failed in raising a manly son, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, now he understood why and, and was at peace about it, which I found to be quite curious. <laughs> and I thought that was the part that really stuck out to me because as being a person in a very similar situation, not completely athletically inclined, spoiler alert, <laughs> um, I just recognize those situations too. My dad wanted me to play football and I played football, but I wasn't great at playing football. And I, and I kind of felt like I let him down. He wanted me to wrestle. I just didn't wrestle. Um, I, it just wasn't something that was, I felt like it was in my DNA. I had no passion for it. My younger brothers ended up wrestling a lot. And so, and, and maybe this isn't, um, this isn't something that's required or necessary. Th these little baggages that we carry around, these little bags of, of uh, weight that are unnecessary, but we do. And I just, when I read that part in your story, I'm like familiar. I, I get it because mm -hmm. um, sometimes innocuous as they might be, these little experiences stay with us for a really, really long time. And, and I, I like the fact that all those years later, you recognize that it probably was carried by your father too. Yeah. That we as parents obviously have expectations for our kids. I've raised five kids myself and rarely do expectations on the parts of parents get, get perfectly met. We're, we're, the real challenge for us as parents, and I think each set of parents learns this in some fashion or ability, that they need to back away enough so that the person, their child can develop into who they really are and and be accepted yeah and and, and I, that really dovetails into the uh, next part of um this the same chapter where and i wanted to talk about the story about mike and and a school teacher as well mm -hmm. um and I, i'm not going to give all the spoilers away in this book but just some <laughs> of these that i thought oh the audience is going to love this um because it's so familiar and, and and i just want to help create that connection to our lived experiences to your lived experience and then uh, how that unfolds. And, and in this particular uh, part of the story, two like both happy and sad experiences. One, I, I want you to just talk a little bit about uh, this project that, that the teacher had you do. Um, and then also, I, I just need to know who this Mike is and, and why Mike is so important to, to your story. <laughs> well, that's great. Um, when it was clear that uh, I wasn't going to uh, amount to anything athletically and I didn't want to be on any sports teams competing with boys, um, I got enrolled in, in Cub Scouting and then you know moved on up through Boy Scouting. And my friend Mike, he, he was uh, new in our troop and right at the time when we went to a summer camp and we bunked together in, uh, in uh, the same tent in summer camp. And we really, as the story goes on, Mike and I continued to be the best of friends following camp. We shared many <coughs> interests, drawing and designing things and a love of old music and skating and ice hockey in the winter and uh, exploring in the summer. Uh, Mike and I were, were best friends all through junior high school and, and high school. We worked together at the same pizza parlor in our hometown for several years. And uh, I went off to architecture school to design buildings and he went off to uh, Detroit to design automobiles. You know, we, and we are still friends today. Um, 
we'll talk a little later maybe about uh, my coming out to Mike. Uh, that happened a lot more recently. But with regard to this assignment, um, we were to write an outline for a story and submit it to our ninth grade English teacher. Um, and then we were going to develop the story once she had worked with us on our outline. And I ginned up in my mind a, a story about two boys who explore things in the woods. And I was reading a lot of Hardy Boys books at that time and Nancy Drew Mysteries. And, you know, I just saw that I could write this short story that kind of mimicked the kind of things that Mike and I would do and want, you know, walking through the woods around our homes in Massachusetts and finding things that have been left behind by, you know, earlier uh, owners of property and so forth. But, um, so here's what happened when I submitted my outline. In my ninth grade English class, we were assigned to, to write a short story. The first step was to prepare and submit an outline of our story. I chose to write one based on the experiences Mike and I had while exploring the woods behind our homes, Im imagining some mystery might be uncovered and solved like the Hardy Boys or Nancy Drew books that I read. I was excited about my story outline, which is really bizarre because, and this is a, 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 I'm exposing myself here, I did not like to write. And here I am reading from a book that I wrote, but at, at the time as a youth, I was did not consider myself a writer and I, I really didn't like to write. If I could figure out how to draw a cartoon and fulfill an essay assignment, I would do it. <laughs> But um, I was excited about this one, about this particular story, more than I had about any assignment. Um, and I mentioned that here since I fulfilled a writing assignment in the seventh grade where I drew a cartoon of my English teacher as, uh, as super English teacher. But in my ninth grade story outline, um, was met, my, out, yeah, my ninth grade story outline was met with disaster. The teacher, read aloud several outlines without reading or revealing the author's names in order to critique them as a means of instruction. Finally, she read mine. Instead of offering constructive criticism, my teacher's words felt like a premeditated taunt. It felt like she was, quote, killing me softly, unquote. As she read my words about two boys who make a surprising discovery as they explore the woods together, she mockingly implied that the outline told the story of two gay boys going into the woods to perform lewd acts. She even added a few comments to flesh out the idea, making the class erupt in laughter. I imagine some thought that was all a joke, not an actual student outline. But I knew better and was mortified. I discarded my story idea and instead submitted a m meaningless one I cared nothing about for which I received a poor grade. Mm. And I was worried I had outed myself by what I did because at the time I did have attractions to Mike. Um, when I came out to him years later, I expressed to him that he was probably my first schoolgirl crush, and he expressed his gratitude for never having known that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, it, was, it was so upsetting to be able to offer something that I really felt like came from inside of me and then to have it be taunted and mocked as something um, lewd or inappropriate. I th I th and for me personally, I think that's where that connection comes in because, and, and then you added the context saying that you, um, you never saw yourself as a writer. You, you never saw yourself as someone who chose to pick up pen and paper and share that story. But here was something as you described an opportunity that you really felt like this was a, this was a good story, a great storyline. And you were excited about the project and someone was there to deflate that. Yeah. Just like baseball. Yeah. Stomp on it. And you know, welcome to my growing up and probably a lot of people's growing up. Um, these kinds of feelings aren't unique to a transgender person or to a gay person. Uh, but I think, it, it, yeah, the, these chapters from my youth are very relatable to uh, the youth of many, if not all. <laughs> 
Yeah, to me, it's just it's just so sad. Um, and we we move forward through um, a lot of the book and a, a lot of these experiences as as you grow older. But we get to the chapter chapter eleven um, that I that I this is kind of the next part of it that I think starts to fill in portions of the story. And and you're discussing. Um, the family proclamation mm-hmm. uh, that comes out after uh, President Hinckley makes this announcement to the General Relief Society, and and you detail, um, I think it's like page one hundred seven, the uh, the experience of um, of listening to that proclamation, trying to to correlate how that fits within your experience, um, but the painful part, the part that I that I get to, um, that I just read over and over and over again is almost a, it, it is the chapter heading, I cannot do Mel anymore. And, and then you start describing that you, you describe the experience and, and maybe I should even add a trigger warning about suicidality mm-hmm. and that, that experience, because this becomes really, really difficult. And I, I just think a, a, a note or two about this experience, um, I don't want to say that we've really set the stage, but leading up to all of these experiences as, as we've gotten all the way to chapter 11 in the book, um, it, it's one event after the next that that's a missed opportunity for you to shine, a mm-hmm. missed opportunity for your family, for work, for someone to benefit from your talents. And it's always been, um, but mm-hmm. yes, but yes. And this is the part where it breaks. And I think this is the part that we should have more conversations about the, the crucial turning points where some people say they can't do it anymore. And, and I, I just want to really highlight this experience in your own words, um, how that unfolded for you. Yeah. So we, we just left ninth grade and now I've been married for 10 years. So we just left a lot of, a lot uh, of the story, a lot of the story, uh, for you to discover dear reader. Um, but to kind of set the context, um, I'd been married 10 years at this point. Um, I was serving as the high priest group leader when that calling still existed in the church, even though I was only like 34 years old at the time, I was a high priest. Um, I talk about the family proclamation getting read and then taught in September of 1995, so almost 30 years ago now. Um, and the fact that I took on that responsibility as a priesthood leader in our ward to teach the principles in this newly revelatory, nearly canonic document, the family proclamation. And, you know, it's so much so that just like I think many families did in the church at that time, we talked about it as a couple, uh, my spouse and I, about how we were doing in our marriage, how we were doing in raising our children. I mean, we really knuckle down on on this document, which, you know, the history of is really was a document set to justify the church's attitude towards marriage and marriage equality. Um, But I took it as this is the this is the pathway to successful uh, living and family life. But um, I described that the following winter, I say in the book, By the end of that winter, after studying this proclamation, my health was dangerously deteriorating. I was experiencing crippling panic attacks at home and persistent irritable bowel syndrome at the office. I did not feel right about myself, who I was, or how I was living. I was constantly on guard and hypervigilant against either crushing criticism or being detected in my femininity. What I'm describing there is something that went back all the way to my, uh, my teenage years, my youth, that um, I took criticism very hard. Um, I have always poured myself into my artwork and my designing and my architecture. I was a licensed architect by the time this experience took place. And I also had done a great deal to contain myself and not be open to others so that then no one could possibly detect like my sexual attraction, you know, in that story in ninth grade to detect my gender identity. Although I didn't have that term at the time, 
that I felt that I was a girl. I didn't, I couldn't let anyone see that in me. Um, so then the event took place. The quotation, which is the title of the chapter as well, I cannot do mail anymore. I can't do mail anymore. I cried out on a Monday morning, March 11th, 1996. I was already late for work, a 45 minute drive away. As I attempted to cross our living room, I became overwhelmed with panic and fell awkwardly to my knees against the wall behind a chair. The kids were at school and Marlene had taken our youngest child out to run errands. Alone in my house, or alone in the house, my panic reached a crescendo as I struggled to focus and move forward. Instead, I found myself fixated on ending my life. My weapon of choice was my car. Even when I felt out of control, it seemed to make sense to my harried mind that I could control my end if I were behind the wheel. Besides, I didn't own a gun or have a bottle of pills. Images of concrete highway barricades or the bridge over the Mohawk River chasm, which I crossed each day, flashed through my mind. If I'd been able to stand up, I might have made it to the car. But instead, I remained crumpled in a heap on the carpet behind the chair. That's the moment my soul cried out in anguish that I could no longer do male, that I could no longer function in the male role expected of me. The cry sprang from deep within me, appropriating the term male from the family proclamation. This marked my first verbalization that I was living at that time, contrary to the, my truth in the 15 years since I had determined to bury my female identity, which happened back when, when I was heading off to college. Shouting it aloud, even if it was the on, only for me to hear, felt empowering. It made me realize that I didn't need to end my life. I just needed to learn how to live in a way that was true to myself. My problem was not the result of external pressures. I didn't cry out that I could no longer work in that office for that man. The crisis I faced came from an identity conflict roiling within me, which I didn't know how to resolve. I stayed on my knees seeking answers until I found relief as the impression came into my mind that God loved me and that my family loved me. This assurance pushed the suicidal thoughts from my mind. I felt a measure of strength in the reality of the love I felt. By then, dr I was drained of all my strength. I went upstairs, removed my clothes, and climbed under the covers and fell into a deep sleep. And I go on to describe that I experienced a significant emotional breakdown that lasted several months. Um, I lost my job in the process, not being able to return to work. And unfortunately, in 1996, when this occurred, I had no information and really no words to describe what I was experiencing. What I was really experiencing was a huge amount of gender dysphoria brought on by the fact that my religion and my work and my family were all demanding all of this male performance that I could no longer hope, keep going, I felt, in, the, in that circumstance. There was no place, no way for me to resolve what I came to know as gender dysphoria. The sad irony is not being able to describe what was happening to me Eventually, when I felt some healing, I went back to living that same life. I went back to, uh, to being the best male priesthood leader, husband, father, provider, church leader, and uh, employee that I could possibly be until 15 more years later when gender dysphoria stopped me in my tracks again, which is where the story will pick up later in which is in the book. Which is in the book. And we're reading uh, Dictates of Conscience, uh, a book by Lori Lee Hall, uh, From Mormon High Priest to My New Life as a Woman, published by Signature Books. Uh, this has been just, just fascinating to me. Um, as we just kind of outline uh, your personal life and how your personal life then really then uh, kind of opens up, uh, the personal life uh, combined with this experience um, of gender dysphoria, gender incongruence, understanding what that looks like, how that functions in your life, and now as it's translating into your professional career. And that's another aspect of the book that I really, really enjoyed because you now start opening up the curtain and letting the readers understand 
uh, how the Mormon church functions. Your job um, as chief architect uh, with the church wasn't just a uh, run-of-the-mill general hire. You had direct access to the leadership of the church, literally to the very top. Yep. You were having direct conversations with the president prophet of the church mm -hmm. on a regular basis mm -hmm. regarding some of Mormonism's uh, most sacred and uh, most visible projects, um, particularly temples all over the world. The, the part that I really, really love uh, about your book um, is you pulling the curtain back, lifting up the hood, and letting everybody get to see how things function, for better or for worse. Because uh, some of these stories that you included in the book um, were great. Like they were, um, I would even say some of them were faith promoting, mm -hmm. and some of them were very spiritual and exciting. Others were like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. When understood in this context, that makes a lot of sense. And one of those um, that that I just found was somewhat fascinating. Um, I can't remember what chapter it is. But we're going to look it up real fast. Uh, I just marked page one fifty or one fifty one, and this um, this was in discussion about the construction of Boyd's Temple. <laughs> Boyd's Temple. Brigham City Temple. The Brigham City, Utah Temple. Um, I found it fascinating because this was a part of a story that I had a little history in just because I had heard it from uh, from an apostle years ago. And, and just hearing your version of the story, it just made a lot of sense because, uh, and I'll let you tell a story, but, but generally, um, I just loved how you kind of display to the audience, to the reader, how the church functions behind the scenes, um, the way its authority works. Uh, we often talk as Latter-day Saints that there's uniformity in the quorum. That, mm -hmm. that the church, unanimity. Unanimity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that the church is always on the same exact page on, the, on all the topics. And once everybody is all on the same page, then they proceed forward with a project. The, your book says something different. And, and I really enjoyed this, this portion uh, about President Packer, the Temple, uh, President Eyring, President Hinckley, President Monson, all players involved. Um, share with us what you know, what you remember, mm -hmm. and, and why it made the book. It's, um, I don't think in, in interviews in the past that I've pulled the curtain back before. So in sitting down to write the memoir, it, it felt essential that I do pull the curtain back and offer just a, uh, just a few of these key experiences that I had, of which there were daily, weekly, monthly things going on, all of which were at this high level. I had to select a couple that were representative uh, or particularly unique in one way or another. And working on the Brigham City Temple was uh, definitely one of those. Um, to kind of catch up from the last answer that I gave, um, when I found myself without employment in 1996, I wound up following the direction of my patriarchal blessing and moving myself and my family to Utah so that I could go to work for the church. And I began working as a project manager in welfare services uh, and that's where working on the Welfare uh, uh, Square project came about. But over a fairly short period of time, I found myself as the chief architect for the church and, uh, and working with the First Presidency directly on temples. And during a five-year period, while President Monson was the president of the church, um, I met with the First Presidency monthly and gave an update on all the temples that were being constructed and shared with them each month the new temple designs that we had prepared for their approval so that we could then get underway with construction. And I give a little bit of background here in the book leading up to this story about Brigham City Temple that the first presidency um, had always, in the church, had always had responsibilities for temples, everything temples, temple design, temple construction, uh, where the real estate was purchased, you know, when the temple would be announced was always a first presidency issue. Quorum of the Twelve had no such opportunity to be involved and they had other assignments and that 
was that it was and probably still is how the church works. Um, except in the case of Brigham City, where Boyd K. Packer, who was the president of the Quorum of the Twelve at the time, and this was 2008, I think, where he was serving as the president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, was also a Brigham City native and a fairly influential member of the church as the president of the Quorum of the Twelve and had been for several years. He had actually, as a, as a boy, had gone to school in the Brigham City Central School that was on the property across from the old Brigham City Tabernacle where the temple was proposed to be built. And so that's the background. Um, I'll pick up in a little bit of the story and then maybe I'll paraphrase a little bit because it can get a little long. But um, about the Brigham City Temple, um, the announcement of this particular temple raised another complex dynamic. Oversight of temple design and construction rested solely with the First Presidency. Members of the Quorum of the Twelve, who had other specific duties, did not participate in, temp in the temple process. But in this case, the president of the Quorum of the Twelve at the time, Boyd K. Packer, Brigham City native, who was a youth attended school on the grounds where this temple would be built. I was in attendance at an early planning meeting of the First Presidency where the concern was brought to light. President Eyring, one of President Monson's counselors, um, asked what role President Packer might have regarding this particular temple and the tension in the room mounted. Um, I can only imagine what kind of behind the scenes, you know, in the corridor around the water cooler and the administration building were taking place that led up to President Eyring having the courage to challenge President Monson about what could Boyd K. Packer do on this temple. And yeah, this is where the ominous, 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 yes. Uh, music plays. This is yeah. like dun 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 <laughs> dun dun dun. Um, <laughs> in a lovely act of grace, President Monson asked for several of us to arrange to visit with President Packer to seek his input regarding the temple. And I, I really, in that moment, President Monson to me seemed like a very a uh, very loving Christian man because he and President Packer had not seen eye to eye a lot in their service together in the Quorum of the Twelve. They were very different types of church leaders. President Monson held all the keys and he could have answered the question that, you know, Boyd's not in a position to have any input on a temple, even if it was built in his backyard. Um, but he didn't. He said, let's have some of you go over and meet. And so um, William R. Walker and, and Keith B. McMullen, who had responsibilities uh, over the temple department and, and our physical facilities department, took the assignment to go as general authorities over those departments to go and meet with President Packer, and I was asked to accompany them as, uh, as the church's architect. Um, Bishop McMullen gave me very specific instructions to uh, listen and take notes, but never say a word, don't speak. You know, I was, I was getting prepared, conditioned by Bishop McMullen to sit down in a meeting where President Packer was going to be, you know, speaking his mind. And, and it wasn't an opportunity for me to dialogue with him. I was to bring along some pictures of other temples so that they could dialogue with him about what the Brigham City Temple might want to look like. Um, so I knew my role. And then I got a phone call from President Eyring. Um, I'll read this part. The unique circumstances of my role in the meeting was soon reinforced when I received a phone call in which a woman on the line asked if I would meet or asked if I would hold for President Henry B. Eyring, who said the following, Brother Hall, you are aware that the design and construction of temples is the sole purview of the first presidency. Of course, President, I replied. Fine, you will report all direction you may receive from President Packard to the First Presidency immediately. Yes. My role was tightly constrained. Listen, take notes, do not speak, receive direction, but don't implement it, and somehow return and report to both parties, even if the ultimate direction from the First Presidency was contradictory to President Packard's. The only chance for success was a truly inspired design solution that all would agree upon. And so we went to the meeting and I was, I was armed with a number of uh, photographs of temples 
specifically the ones that Bishop McMullen had asked me to bring along. And I, I was really concerned because the ones I was asked to bring along were all very modern contemporary designs. And I knew that President Packer was an individual who detested modern architecture, contemporary design, but I had felt impressed. It was one of those spiritual moments, you know, this is a faith promoting experience where I felt impressed to bring a picture of the Kansas City Temple that was under construction that had a little bit more of a historic design flavor to it. And, and yet I knew that Bishop McMullen didn't know that I had that picture. So I watched as we sat down around this little round table in President Packer's office. He was sitting on one end um, in his wheelchair and kind of slumped down and not looking like he was feeling very well. And Elder Walker on one side and Bishop McMullen on the other side flanking him. And that left only directly across the table from President Packer for me to sit down, which left me feeling like I'm in charge of the meeting, you know, in, in typical group dynamics. But the other two gentlemen, uh, the general authorities, started the meeting, shared one by one all the pictures that I had brought of the contemporary temples, and President Packer barely raised his eyes. He, his hands were just sitting in his lap, and one by one, these pictures wound up on the desk without any comment. And then the room fell silent. So I'll, I'll pick up, if I can, in the book at that point. The presentation went quickly without President Packer uttering a, single, uttering a single word. But the look on President Packer's face and his body language as he slumped uncomfortably in his wheelchair spoke volumes. He was not impressed by our current temples at all. The men whom I accompanied sat in embarrassed silence. At that moment, I had to decide if I possessed the courage to follow the impression that I had and violate the specific instructions I had been given to not speak. Catching Bishop McMullen's gaze, I whispered, may I show one more? Out of options, he nodded almost imperceptibly. I pulled out the rendering of the Kansas City Temple and handed it across the table to President Packer. He hadn't touched any of the other temple photos, but picked this one up and studied it intently, holding it close to his eyes. As he set it back on the table, on top of all the others, he began speaking to me as, as, as though we were alone. He talked with me about how nearly perfect the design was of the design of the Kansas City Temple was for Brigham City. A smile came across his face as he said, this will do nicely but with nine bays of windows instead of those seven. He took out a pen from his coat pocket and sketched on the image an extended sidewall of the temple with two additional bays. Can we do this? Yes, of course, President, I responded. He continued to discuss his thoughts regarding the temple with me while the two general authorities sat either side listening silently. In conclusion, President Packer requested that I be permitted to return and share with him the design of the temple as it progressed. And um, I walked back to the church office building with the two other general authorities and I apologized for overstepping my bounds, but they uh, were very grateful for how things turned out. And I was newly empowered to be the voice and uh, connection to President Packer on this temple. We went back and responded to the First Presidency that this is what we were taught and asked to do. They felt great about it. We proceeded with the design, and as each step of the design went along, I went alone to President Packer's office, and we sat and together reviewed all of the images of the design as it was being developed. And then over time, as it was in construction, I brought back construction photos of the temple. And each time he intently looked at all of them and concluded with, um, will this be done while I'm still alive? And I said, well, <laughs> I, I, I think at least one time I said, well, President, can you give me an idea what date that's going to be? <laughs> but um, that's, that was the nature of the familiarity of our relationship at that point. Um, I could joke with him about that, but I assured him we were working with all dispatch. And then in the second... Um, gracious act on the part of President Monson, he allowed President Packer to 
preside over the dedication of that temple all, all the sessions um, and to give the dedicatory prayers. And then he went on to live three more years <laughs> after the temple was dedicated. So we, we definitely made it in time. Um, one of the things that I include in the book is the fact that when President Packer saw the c completed temple construction photos, um, keeping in mind that he was the author of the book, The Holy Temple, you know, a, a seminal um, book on the doctrines of the temple of the church. Um, he said that the Brigham City Temple was to the Salt Lake Temple as the Son is to the Father, referring to the Son of God and, and Elohim. To me, that was the most sacred compliment that he could offer from his perspective and context that we had produced a temple that captured the essence, the familial essence, the kinship um, with the Great Salt Lake Temple and had built it in the 21st century. So that was that was quite an experience. And it was something that as, uh, as a native to Brigham City, Boyd could be proud of that. Boyd was happy. Yeah. Yeah. And the first presidency was happy because Boyd was happy. And, the, you know, there was peace in the land because we had walked that careful path completely out of process of how we normally worked, introducing an additional client, if you will, into an already complex um, project dynamic and had navigated that successfully. And the product was beautiful. Like the, the result was a beautiful temple. Yeah. It, and, and it's prominent and you can see it. And it, it, to me, it, it sits there across from the tabernacle feeling as though it had always been there. And that was something that I felt very pleased with. There's just side note and curious, why nine windows instead of seven? Um, he, there was some, he didn't have a reason that he expressed, but there was, there was something about the proportionality that he felt Kansas City was a little bit short and Brigham City needed to be a little bit longer. In fact, he was absolutely right because the endowment rooms in Brigham City are bigger. And so everything about the temple needed to be a little bigger. So if, um, if he hadn't asked for that, I'd have probably come back with something like that anyway, because the temple did need to have a bigger footprint than Kansas City did. But there was something about that nine bays that he felt would give it just the right proportionality. And it turned out very nice. And I, I love as we kind of go through your story and go through the book, um, you give examples of these behind the curtain experiences. And, and one behind the curtain experience that I really enjoyed in the book was not about what was happening uh, with a member of, of the church's leadership, but with you. And <laughs> that, that came just a, a, just a couple pages later um, when you're describing the experience and laying out the Provo City Center Temple. Mm -hmm. uh, after its disastrous fire, and the uh, the powers that be uh, all met together, and it was you that was chosen as the person who would um, kind of uh, put this all together, and 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 start with a design. On page one sixty five, uh, you write, "I envisioned the layout of the rooms on these on three building floors." Though the tabernacle had a two-story facade, its interior only had been on one level with a mezzanine balcony. I thought through how the temple support uh, I, th I thought through how the temple support areas like the dressing rooms and the mechanical systems could work, as well as how temple patrons would symbolically and physically move through the temple. And at the same time, I also committed to the principles that there would be no visible building additions to the original historical form of the tabernacle. Like our design plans for the renovated Salt Lake Tabernacle, I produced quick sketches describing the three levels of the new temple. We would excavate several le layers, uh, levels below the former main floor with additional underground spaces created beneath a park adjacent to the tabernacle. In less than a couple of hours, the layout was clear and ready to develop. I determined the handful of people I would trust to show these sketches to who developed the design into a full presentation to the church's leadership. The next line, I want to be your line because okay. I thought this was the most beautiful part of this whole experience. I did all this while sitting at my grandparents' table as Lori. 
I got the phone call at my home confidentially asking that I consider whether the Provo temp Tabernacle could be developed into a temple. I was home alone, and I had dressed myself up as Lori and was exploring my female gender identity, still very privately because I wasn't out to anyone at that point. And when the call came to, to do the study that Kyle just read, um, I was so excited about being able to do it that I just sat down at my little computer desk, which was my grandparents' old uh, breakfast table, and, and I sketched it out, only then realizing that I had done the whole thing while presenting authentically. And I think I mentioned in here that I was still at a point that I wasn't sure whether dressing as a woman was a sin or whether you know I was offensive to the Holy Ghost for presenting myself as female. And then I just had this experience and it incredibly increased my confidence that no heaven could possibly be okay with me being who I am. Um, because this inspired design just flowed out of um, my thoughts and onto paper that literally those sketches were transformed into the floor plans of the temple and it was announced a couple months later and you know the following may less than 11 months after i got the call to do that design it was groundbreaking we started that incredible construction project i loved it i, I loved that whole story i, I love the story of the the, the provo ta tabernacle transforming into the provo city center temple um, i love the fact that um, Brother Hall, as was indicated in the church temple department, was transformed uh, into Sister Hall. Mm -hmm. uh, very literally uh, and symbolically uh, at the very same and table. Sim simultaneously. <laughs> and simultaneously. Yeah. I, I just always believe that this is like the most beautiful part of, of your story. And there's so many more chapters. Yeah. Um, uh, so many more chapters. The the latter part of, of the book now describes, um, in fact, I believe one of the chapters is called Dictates of My Conscience, or Dictates uh, yeah, of My yeah, Conscience, Following the conscience. Dictates of My Conscience. And this is where you start um, telling the story, and I, I, don't want, I don't want to jump into it too much because I really want the audience to, to read and, and start kind of analyzing it. Uh, but this is where uh, church leadership now takes control of your trajectory. Mm -hmm. They start determining... Um, not in a manner that is thankful for the service that you gave to Mormonism, but uh, a CYA to cover their behinds, mm -hmm. um, to now start protecting themselves legally. Uh, and I say that in air quotes as if you're a threat, mm -hmm. but they begin to shield themselves from you. And I'm curious um, if there was a reason why uh, the chapter was called following the dictates of my conscience, as you unfold, again, pulling the curtain back um, and naming names and describing exactly what those experiences were like. Uh, what Was there a reason why you chose that title um, to describe that experience? Well, as, um, as the story continues, um, as my story continues to unfold, um, I express how I came to a spiritual confirmation that what I sensed when I designed the Provo City Center Temple actually was true that heaven knew me to be who I authentically am. And was there was joy in heaven that I had caught up with understanding who they knew me always to have been. So I had had personal spiritual experiences that confirmed to me in, in very beautiful and deep ways that I was a beloved daughter of my heavenly parents. And one of the significant challenges i think for the modern church and i think i see it a lot amongst um, members and people trying to struggle within the church still is that um, we're taught to seek and obtain personal revelation but at the same time if our personal revelation doesn't jive with current church dogma or policy then our personal revelation must be wrong because the only revelation we could possibly receive would be confirmation of what 
the president of the church has said, which isn't, doesn't leave open a self-interpretation or self-determination whatsoever. And so this concept of following the dictates of conscience, um, to me, is, a, is an attempt to really lean in. You know, and it's the title of the book, it's the title to the 18th chapter, and, and there's some significant places where I use the phrase, including at my excommunication, um, that indicate that I am moving forward with living my life according to the light that I've received from deity, not according to anyone else's light that they may have received for themselves, or in general, the revelation that might be um, the current policies enforced or taught by the church. Um, I really sense that if there's a major overarching lesson in my story, it's that we each deserve the right to discover what the dictates of our conscience are, and then we need to be supported and reinforced and encouraged to live according to those dictates, um, according to that light we've received. I am, um, as these chapters continue, you said I mentioned names, I, and I do, um, I had a, a slew of interviews in late 2012, particularly with general authorities, including Bishop Stevenson and Elder Whitney Clayton. Um, as Bishop they, Stevenson at the time, who is now, who an, is now apostle. an apostle. That's correct. And um, at the time, um, in late 2012, I was still serving as stake president, and I, um, and I was uh, directing the, des the design of temples at that time. And they were trying to sort out what to do with me. Um, some, very, some very exaggerated information had gotten back to Elder Clayton regarding my behavior as a, that stake president out in Tooele who, uh, you know, was running around in a dress, um, which was serious exaggeration at that point. Um, but they, uh, they were very concerned, like you said, for what m my supposed actions would be in terms of a reflection upon the church. Um, so a couple of, uh, after those several interviews, a couple of, uh, um, First presidency level decisions were made. One was to um, release me from my calling as stake president, and they were kind enough to do that in an honorable way as opposed to a dishonorable way. Um, and the other was to agree that they, they, the first presidency, were very appreciative and confident in my work as their chief architect, and they wanted me to stay. And as long as I was temple worthy, um, and so the presiding bishopric, the managing director of Church Human Resources and the church council, Elder Lance B. Wickman, um, sat down and crafted um, a number of constraints that if I would follow those constraints, I would be considered employable. And, um, and those were revealed to me in additional interviews. And then over the course of the next year or so, there was follow-up on how well I was keeping to those constraints. While I was still a church employee, I eventually, I eventually uh, broke every one of those constraints as time went by because I couldn't not, I couldn't follow that onerous level of, uh, of control on my life. I like the word control. Yeah. Because as I read through that, that's exactly what was happening. Yeah. And this wasn't just uh, employment control. Uh, some of the things that the church was requiring you to do is not dress uh, in feminine clothing at home, in it, your own home. Yeah, do nothing to mitigate my gender dysphoria, which was at that point diagnosed. And I had the documents that I shared with them that, that indicated what needed to happen to help me to mitigate the dysphoria that was often knocking me out of work at church, at the church. Um, you know, I just, I struggled some days to get up and put on the suit and tie and go to work, even though I loved my job. There was just some days when it was too difficult to do. They cut all of that off and demanded that 24 seven, that I tow this very, very fine line of what they considered to be appropriate level of behavior to be a church employee. 
they they went as far as to discuss the actual colors of clothing yeah. that should be worn. Uh, they prohibited you from cutting your hair uh, in a feminine style. As I just read through the list that that Elder Stevenson laid out, mm -hmm. it was mind boggling to me. And I include in the book um, portions of letters that I wrote to Bishop Stevenson and to Elder Clayton and to Elder Clark as well as portions of letters that I received back from them, which contain this instruction, um, directly quoting from the source documents, all of which I had fortunately kept. Uh, when you pull the curtain back and, and start discussing things like this, my instant question is then ramific ramifications. Um, is this a good look for the church? How would the church respond to this? Has the church responded to this? Have you heard from Elder Stevenson, Bishop Stevenson at the time. Um, any feedback? Well, I, and clearly they haven't read the book yet, but they're... they're. <laughs> I hope th they do read it. They're aware of this. I hope it's read with an open mind. I don't suspect that that'll be the case, but I'm sure someone will be assigned to read it and report back on it. I think one thing I'm grateful for is that there's been a passage of time. You know, the the interviews that we're currently talking about happened 12 years ago. A lot of water under the bridge, but many of the players are in the same or even more um, uh, higher, I should say, positions of authority within the church. Um, but hopefully, you know, time provides perspective for them as it has for me. Um, in 2015, um, Dallin H. Oaks, who was then a member of the Quorum of the Twelve, said regarding transgender members that the church had a lot still to learn and to teach on the subject. Um, that was a great admission. Um, that was two and a half to three years after the moment in time that we're currently talking about when I was laying gender identity out in front of them in great detail. Um, there were times when Bishop Stevenson, to me, because I think he was showing me when we met in person, he was showing me his heart. He was showing me how he really felt about things. But then when it got to letters and things that were put in writing, somebody else may have been writing them. They were certainly legally processed, you know, to be um, court worthy if that were ever needed. But from his heart, Bishop Stevenson was very interested in my sense my feelings my journey and i really sensed that i had a moment with him where he was the chief temporal officer of the church worldwide at that time where he was receiving light and knowledge on the subject of gender dysphoria from me um, because i happened to be the person in the church who was closest enough to him to be able to tell him i th i felt like that was a positive experience um and then those, you know, he'd have to respond in letters that would hold up in court. Um, and that was, that mismatch was, you know, that was crazy feeling for me. It was difficult to, to sense and receive. And I think one of the reasons why ultimately my last letter to Bishop Stevenson was extremely direct. And I said that I will be transitioning to live full time as a woman. And I want to continue to contribute to the church. And that was in August of 2013. A year and a half later, Dallin Oaks is still saying they needed to learn about transgenderism and they needed to, to figure out how to teach about it. And it's taken them until now um, to apply some of that teaching. We'll get into that in a few minutes. Exactly. And uh, it has been pretty. But um, it was, uh, I, I guess I could say that in the church, I was trans before trans was a, was a, was a worry. Um, I had a chance to talk about it with them. They saw firsthand. And, and it wasn't, uh, I mean, sometimes when we're so distant from the subject, uh, it takes a long time to kind of understand. But I think in your case, you had direct access to the president of the church. Um, you had continual discussion with uh, the first presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve in various capacities. You had direct discussions with the presiding bishopric of the church. You had direct dis discussions with uh, legal counsel. It's not that you were unknown. It, and, and, was, yeah. and I think further, 
uh, these same people were involved in your excommunication and the discussion of that excommunication and releasing you um, in certain callings. Uh, so, again, I, I think if, if ever you needed a master class um, in the transgender experience, especially at the intersection of in Mormonism specifically, they had someone right there that they could speak to. They mm -hmm. had someone right there that they, can, they could have leaned into, but they didn't. Yeah. One person did. <laughs> so all of those general authority interviews culminated in my release as stake president, but also culminated in all of these constraints on my employment. But all of that happened as a result of members of the Quorum of the Twelve and the Bishopric meeting with the First Presidency to review my situation. And that occurred in November of 2012. Um, I was at that time meeting regularly, meaning monthly, with the First Presidency, as I've mentioned earlier, regarding the design and construction of the temples. And it's an interesting thing to note that when they met on Thursday in the Salt Lake Temple, in the upper rooms of the Salt Lake Temple, to discuss me being released as a stake president, it was Boyd K. Packer who made the recommendation that I be honorably released. The very same President Packer who had just dedicated a month earlier the Brigham City Temple that he felt was an inspired design. And he had to have understood that he was talking about me being a transgender state president, having only worked with me closely for the previous four years on his his temple. His landmark temple. His landmark his temple. His legacy temple. Yeah. And so getting to the thing that you uh, that you set up for me, um, the next day, the bishopric and the first presidency met and discussed my situation as an employee. The following Thursday, while it was still undoubtedly very fresh on their minds that their chief architect was transgender, I had my monthly meeting with the first presidency. And I got to the, to the room earlier than usual and was nervous as can be because I didn't know really how they'd received me and how they'd received the information that Bishop Stevenson had shared with them. I just knew that I was going to be in the room doing what I had done several times before, but now they knew what I knew about myself. <laughs> And they knew that I knew that they knew, <laughs> if you will. That's a lot of new. That's a lot of knowing going on. And um, first person to come into the room after, 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 once I'd gotten myself set up and checked all my images and made sure everything was ready to go was President Uchtdorf. Dieter Uchtdorf was the second counselor in the first presidency at the time. And he would normally, when he walked into the room, uh, directly across the table from where I was standing, waiting for their arrival, he would normally go to... The, to my right, to the head of the table, and take his seat beside President Monson's chair. Instead, he broke left and came around the table so that he could come to me and greet me personally. Um, my, my fear went off the top of the chandelier, I think. <laughs> he reached out, he put his arm around me and pulled me tight against him and put his other arm around my 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 other arm and we were literally face to face as close as we could get without bopping glasses and he he said we are so grateful that you are here with us <laughs> you know in his big german accent voice and i just melted into his embrace and and shed some tears i felt as though i had i had arrived and been accepted. I was, yes, still male presenting um, to meet their needs and, and still under these constraints. But a member of the First Presidency on behalf, I felt of all of them, were grateful that I was there and grateful to take me as I was. I'm so glad to finally get to talk to you, Lori. Someone else was really, really grateful. And someone else knew a lot about who <laughs> you were. Yeah. This was a part of your book that just blew me away. Chapter 21, beginning my life as a new woman. Uh, your secretary, Susan. Yes. Which, of I'm, course, all the names have been changed to protect people's privacy. I'm glad 
to finally get to talk to Lori. Yeah. So this happened on the day that my um, assistant who, who had worked for me for probably 10 years at this point, um, and, and she was, this was the day of her retirement. And she had been a church employee and worked in the church office building since the day they opened the doors. She had 40 plus years of working in that building full time or part time. And she, she comes into my office on the day of her retirement and says that line, I'm glad to finally get to talk to Lori. Well, I was out as transgender by the time she said this, because that story is also contained elsewhere in the book, how I wound up outing myself to everybody in my department. But I'd never given anyone a notion of what my true name was. And so when she used my true name, I, I was so aghast. I just, you know, I, I was just sucking air at that point. So here's the description that I wrote. It was March of 2016, and my longtime assistant Susan was sitting across from me on her last day before retiring after 44 years of working in the church office building. Her smile was more coy than usual, and her eyelids twinkled. In our time together, she'd survived cancer and chemo treatments twice and often looked tired and weak, but that was not the case today. During her multiple illnesses, I aggressively protected her position with me. She frequently reiterated that she would never work for another man, and she always emphasized man when she said that. We developed a deep and, pr and primarily unspoken loyalty to each other. Her use of my true name for the first time in my church office was entirely out of context, and I reeled from the surprise of it. My gape, gaping expression conveyed my unspoken, how did you know? Susan was delighted to finally reveal her long-guarded secret. I monitored your email while you were traveling in case something time-sensitive needed your immediate attention. Susan explained, sometimes you wrote emails to yourself containing your journal entries. Many of them described your gender dysphoria and coming to terms with your true identity as Lori. This happened for many years, including coming out to myself and God during the work trip to Lisbon when I'd received my first spiritual confirmation. I responded, so you read all of them? I was initially aghast at the apparent invasion of my privacy and the liberties that she had taken. She... Oops. Susan's smile spread even broader, giving me my answer. I marveled that she never let on what she knew about me all that time, but waited until the day before she retired to tell me. During our years together, Susan had had two difficult bouts of cancer and chemotherapy. Throughout the entire experience, she had worked as often as she could. When I received pressure from human resources to replace her with someone who could work daily, I aggressively protected her position and protected her. She told me frequently that she would never work together for another man. Now I understood her dry humor. Susan explained that she knew she was protecting me at every turn. She covered for me during each therapist's and doctor appointment, which at times were several per month. She never said a word when I came into the office late every Monday with my poor face and neck raw from electrolysis treatments and the untreated whiskers showing sloppy four-day growth. Susan kept my schedule clear on Monday afternoons so I could hide in my office and heal unseen. When my appearance started changing, I grew out my hair longer and my face and body became softer and more feminine through uh, hormone replacement therapy. And colleagues would come by her desk questioning what was happening with me. She feigned that she had no idea what they were talking about. As I comprehended this new revelation of all Susan had done for me, my heart overflowed with gratitude for her. I realized I had benefited far more from her loyalty than she ever had with mine. Everyone needs a Susan. Everyone needs a Susan. And uh, I, I obviously would not have survived the four years that I was on probation at the church offices from the time that the letter came from Bishop Stevenson to the time that I finally um, retired and was pushed out of church employment. I wouldn't have survived those four years without her. I just love, I just love that story. Yeah. And this it's is so a, good. This is a 60-something-year-old grandma um, 
widow and, and a diligent uh, member of the church who chose to love and protect me that way. I wish I could say that that was the book end of the book, and there are still happy experiences. Of course. Uh, the, the Susan experience wasn't just the happiest uh, portion, but the, the printing of the book actually was a little bit delayed. Um, yeah. because of a uh, circumstance that neither of actually I shouldn't say that, that we didn't know was happening because both you and I were aware that something was brewing uh, within the church um, office building regarding some handbook changes but you've addressed those uh, just recently the church did make some changes to its uh, handbook of instruction uh, and how it uh, deals with understands uh, and ministers to and I think minister is probably a very generous word uh, <laughs> to its transgender Latter-day Saints. It's, it's really entirely about restrictions, layered upon layered uh, upon transgender members of the church. Cloaked in ministry. Yeah, cloaked in, you know, in feigned love and interest and concern, particularly regarding those who, using their words, have transitioned away from their biological sex at birth. And unfortunately, you know, back in 2015, when Dallin Oaks said, we have a lot to learn and a lot to teach regarding transgender, um, my worst fears came to pass. It was wonderful to hear a general authority, especially a senior general authority, speak the word transgender. And I think that interview was the first time that I heard, had heard that. But then I also realized that if we get in there their sights, if we're in their scope and we get a target put on us, the results might not be affirming. And as it's turned out, it's taken nine years. But on top of the declaration that President Oaks made in October of 2019, that gender is equivalent to biological sex at birth, this new po set of policy restrictions on transgender members anchors every paragraph to those who have transitioned away from their biological sex at birth, reinforcing and doubling down and taking away from local leaders any wiggle room to, uh, to negotiate local needs and local perceptions of an individual's uh, desire to be, to be participating in the church. Um, specifically, um, the restrictions, um, although there's mention of using legal names or preferred names, which of course we mentioned at the beginning of our interview was something that my original state president at the time uh, of my excommunication did not allow me to do, but it's reinforced now that preferred names can be used. The remainder of it goes on to point out that those that have transitioned away from their biological sex at birth um, not only have no access to the priesthood or to a temple recommend, the ordinances of the temple, which has been the case for some time, which I think many people were comfortable living with that as a restriction, but whereas the past several years of church handbook has allowed local leaders lots of room for interpretation as to how a transgender member participates in their unit in terms of classes and, and activities and so forth. These new restrictions indicate that those that have transitioned away um, are required to only attend classes and activities associated with their, gen their biological sex at birth, which means I suppose as I mentioned in the book, that when I first transitioned and was still a, an active church member, I was invited to high priest group more than once. Um, and I just, I felt awkward. I felt it would be ridiculous for me to walk into a high priest group meeting in heels and a skirt. But more importantly, why would I be in a high priest group meeting if I'd been asked to no longer utilize my priesthood because I was a woman, which had happened, and it would be mockery of my self-determined gender identity to show up in a high priest group mm -hmm. meeting. Great point. Yeah, and but yet I was denied uh, uh, initially from going to uh, to Relief Society, 
well, that's now off the table. Even though I found wards um, such as the Liberty Ward that I mentioned in Salt Lake in the book, and also our ward in Crestwood, Kentucky, where I had been welcomed to Relief Society. Of course, all this occurred post-excommunication, but I, I have a faith community that I could have gone to Relief Society any week I wanted to and was always welcome there. That's no longer available. Individuals attend meetings and activities associated with their biological sex at birth. Transgender individuals, those that have transitioned, are not allowed to teach in the church. I love to teach. I had a post-excommunication um, assignment to teach a gospel principles class in Liberty Ward in Salt Lake. Um, I loved being able to contribute that way. Can't teach now. Transgender members who have transitioned are not allowed to teach, are not allowed to have any calling associated with children or youth. Obviously, the underlying message being that we're a danger. We're a perceived threat to the safety of the children and youth in the church. So no teaching, no interaction with youth or, or, uh, or children, uh, only gender-related activities and classes, which for someone who's transitioned, as I've pointed out, is, is a mockery of who we are. Um, I look both through my own lens, but also through the lens of young people in, who are living in families that are Latter-day Saint families in the church coming on up, and the restrictions include them not being able to stay at overnight activities, regardless of which overnight activity by gender or not, you know, by their target gender or by their birth sex, they're not allowed to stay overnight because obviously a 14 year old trans female young woman who maybe goes on a teacher's quorum outing can't stay overnight because why? They're dangerous. It creates complexity, sexuality. Um, is it going to affect the others? Are, the, are all the boys in the teacher's quorum going to turn into girls? What's going on here? Um, so no overnight activities, but it goes on to explain in detail how this gets implemented. The young person, <laughs> should they have been brave enough to show up at such an activity, gets handed over to a guardian or a parent and sent to an off-site location where they can be appropriately safe safely away from you know the other members of the ward i think i recall the word is escorted escorted they away. escort them away yes and uh, you know so i look at that and i go okay well that pretty much excludes any not just not just those who have transitioned but any gender variant young person and and the current generation of young people are exploring their gender presentation whether they're transgender or not uh, in many cases, gender presentation is, you know, it's all fair game for, for the youth of today, from what I'm observing as an old person now. Agreed. And um, at what point does this restrictive policy set up a police state where grumpy old members of the church look at youth, maybe look at a girl who has a, a really short haircut or likes to wear men's ties, you know, with dress shirts like my sister did when she went to, to high school. You know, is that person just because they're expressing a style? Is that someone who we have to be afraid of? They're not transgender. My sister's not transgender, but she'd like to wear men's shirts and, and ties to high school. And that was 40 years ago. <laughs> well, what happens when our, when our youth don't conform to the for the strength of youth bi gender binary presentation in all their classes and meetings? Do they all get hunted down and excluded? I mean, I worry about this because it seems as though this judgmental police state gets created by such restrictions that that takes in far more people than I think it intended to. I think what they're worried about is, you know, is dangerous old trans women like myself being a nuisance and a, and a, and a threat. 
but it's going to affect our young people. It's going to affect kids who are coming up in Latter-day Saint homes who are still trying to reconcile their faith identity with their gender identity. The thought just occurred to me as you were, because we talked about uh, Lance Wickman, who is general counsel for the church. And in 2006, he had an interview with Dallin H. Oaks where they mm -hmm. described officially what the, the church's official position is on homosexuality. Um, and uh, Oaks in that interview said something that I just, just had this epiphany. Uh, he said uh, something to the effect of, we don't want to take you out in public because to take you out in public would uh, require us to approve or it would, it would visibly be something that could be considered an approval of your relationship. Some sort of tacit compliance, <laughs> if you will. Yeah, and so as you're describing that, um, just because the, the, the policy is very clear, just dressing uh, is considered now transition. Mm -hmm. So maybe the church's fear is that just the appearance means that that could be the church's approval. Therefore, they can't have that appearance anywhere near one of their activities, one of their chapels, which to me is mind boggling. Yeah, I, I would be willing to bet that 50% of the active youth don't appear with, you know, within the strict gender binary, you know, at young men's and young women's meetings at camps, at, you know, just it, it, it blows my mind to think that, that that kind of restriction is going to affect so many young people. And, and we're talking about, and if we ever want to have a long discussion about uh, historical or contemporary uh, clothing and design, uh, for a church that is so founded in its original founders, um, which the, the framers of the United States Constitution wore leggings, uh, curly hair and wigs and makeup. Mm -hmm. So we're very much looking at restrictions that are being applied by the church, which mimic the extreme, perhaps Christian national conservatism of the current moment within the United States politics. And, and the church seems to have gone down this road of reinforcing their beliefs in line with the most conservative of society's beliefs in this moment in time, as though this was the mind and the will of the Lord. Exactly what I was going to say, cloaked as revelation mm -hmm. and the word of God. And yet it is so harmful that I, I think others have seen it, and I, I agree that this is on the level of the difficulty and the draconian nature of the policy of exclusion of November 2015 was against sexual orientation. I mentioned towards the conclusion of my memoir that the church has been on the wrong side of history with regard to race and had policies in place for, for many, many decades that restricted minority race. And in 2015, they came out with a policy that attacked and restricted and even forced the hunting down of same-sex couples. So they're going after minority sexual orientation. And now we see this now in 2024 goes against minority gender identity. And discrimination to the point of spiritual violent discrimination against race, orientation, or identity is still discrimination. It's still wrong, and the church and its current leaders are on the wrong side of history on this issue, and I address that in the afterword of the book, which is why it isn't out yet, because we had to write that part. Um, but I hope that my story has meaning to all those who might be looking at these things and trying to sort this all out for themselves, whether they be um, transgender individuals, family members, allies, church members who don't know if they've ever no known a transgender person but are appalled at what appears to be, a, once again, inappropriate, unchristian-like behavior. I hope that my story will help to shed light on what it means to be transgender, on what it means to struggle as a transgender individual, 
in society, in employment, in high demand religion, um, and the courage that it takes, but also the joyfulness associated with authentically coming out and walking the path that corresponds to my dictates of conscience, to their dictates of conscience, and to be able to successfully not just survive, which creates a happy ending in and of itself, but to thrive, which is the happy ending I want for everyone. I love that part. I, I love the, the idea that this is uh, something to smile and rejoice and, and be happy about. Yeah. We've been reading um, from Dictates of Conscience, uh, a book that Lori Lee Hall, uh, we hadn't really mentioned the word memoir. It is your memoir. It is. Um, but it's also a history book. And it's, it really is an opportunity for us to dissect the history of uh, the transgender experience and that intersection of uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in particular um, and, and how that influenced you and, and how, in a very real way, you influenced the church. So it is available. Um, where, can, uh, where can the listeners uh, pick this book up? It was published through Signature. Signature Books and uh, will be available by November 11th, which is Transgender Awareness Week. Excuse me, not November 11th, November 20th, which is Transgender Awareness Week. Um, available wherever you buy your books, but particularly it's available on Amazon. We're pre-selling currently on Amazon, and uh, it's been in the top 10 to 20 to 30 new releases in both Mormonism as a category and LGBTQ biographies and memoirs as a category for like the last six weeks. So there's a lot of interest already, which I'm very excited about. Um, but you can pre-order and we've, we've committed to printing way more than they were planning on commi committing to print. And so we're going to print enough so that we aren't going to run out of them. And uh, I hope that everyone comes with me on this journey and learns the things that, uh, that you need to feel and learn from it. Yeah, uh, and I, I think it's a very clean, um, simple, I don't want to say it's like an easy read because we're talking about some pretty in-depth uh, material, but it's, uh, I mean, it's nearly 400 pages. It, it, it's a lot of great information. Uh, personally, I thoroughly enjoyed the book. Um, and, and that was really without even interjecting with my own personal bias about how much I love and appreciate you. Um, it, was, it was just a well... Uh, written, great, uh, just investigation, uh, introspection uh, story of of your experience, and I just appreciated it. And I, I know I know a, a, a reader, a learner, a listener will be able to learn something from your book. So thank you for writing it. Thank you for being vulnerable and sharing uh, this part of your life because there there are parts of this book that. Um, dive further into your personal story than what we've uh, discussed on this podcast in over the last few year, few mm -hmm. years and other podcasts, Mormon stories that you've done and, and all your own personal uh, experiences and, and uh, what you've shared with affirmation and, and affirmation is included in the book as well. It is. Uh, as your senior vice president of affirmation um, for a few years. So, so much, really? so much in this book, but thank you. I'm, I'm so pleased and I'm grateful to be able to talk with you today about it. And there are a number of other podcasts as well. If I could blow some horns of some others, I'll be on uh, several of the other podcasts that circle around Mormonism and LGBTQ. Um, and uh, we've got a lot of book events coming up where um, meet the author and to ask me specific questions and you know find out things that Kyle forgot to ask me and <laughs> oh and, it, and we talked about this kind of pre-interview like some of the things that that just it piqued my interest mm -hmm. and and things that I think that maybe the, the audience would be interested in and I personally am, am going to be interested in in hearing what other uh, resources what other podcasts what other groups um, find fascinating and interesting just because I, I, I just really enjoyed the book yeah so. thank you I think there's a lot there that transcends Mormonism. There's a lot there that transcends the LGBTQ experience. Um, there's there there's things there that transcend growing up in dysfunctional families and being in a dysfunctional marriage. And uh, there's applicability in the story intentionally to have very broad appeal 
And if you don't have any of those things going on in your life, I would invite you to read anyway, because I believe that, again, stories are powerful and stories change minds. And sometimes stories can save lives. Oh, amen. Yeah. Uh, That's a great way to end. It's Dictates of Conscience. Lori Lee Hall, uh, a memoir available on uh, Amazon through Signature Books. Uh, pre-order your copy after, if you're catching this interview, after November 20th. Uh, you can pick that up directly through Amazon, Signature Books, and other uh, book sellers. I love that you talked about the story because it's stories very literally when we write our own stories. But stories like yours, Lori Lee, stories like mine, and stories like yours that help us each continue writing our own latter-day story.